it may be a good time to pause the video to read the five slides of the press release before a video footage of the actual press conference. Thank you all very much for coming today. Um, my name is Susan Smith, I'm a co-director of Women Scotland and we are delighted and honoured to be hosting two British Olympians today. Sharon Davis is a swimmer who was selected aged 13 to represent Great Britain at the 1976 Summer Olympics in Montreal. The following year she won two bronze medals in the 1977 European Championship. In 1978, age 15, she won gold medals at the Commonwealth Games 200 and 400 metres individual medley. She held a Commonwealth record for the 400 metre individual medley for 18 years. She took the silver medal in the 400 metre medley in the 1980 Moscow Olympics behind East German Petra Schneider, who later admitted that the victory was drug enhanced. In the 1993 New Year's Honours, Sharon was appointed a member of the Order of the British Empire for services to swimming. Mara Yumichi is a long distance runner who became a full time athlete at the age of 33 after a decade working as a diplomat in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. She won the bronze medal in the 2006 Melbourne Commonwealth Games. 10,000 metres, winning the sorry, ten, <laughs> winning the 2008 Osaka Ladies Marathon, finishing runner-up in the 2009 London Marathon, and finishing sixth at the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Thank you both for travelling up to be with us today. We really appreciate it. We're also joined by Fiona from Fair Play for Women, um, who have been doing a great deal of work on sporting fairness across the UK. As many of you will know, the Scottish Parliament is currently considering legislation that will allow anyone over the age of 16 to change their sex in law. So any man who says he identifies as a woman will be able to change his legal status by making a simple statutory declaration. For Women Scotland have grave concerns about the potential consequences on the, of this law on women's hard-won rights, including the impact on women's sport. Last month, MSPs took evidence on this impact, of the impact of this law on sport. They heard from two male witnesses representing Sport Scotland and Leap Sport Scotland. However, they did not take evidence from any female athletes, the very people who might be impacted. And that's why we wanted to invite Sharon and Mara here today. We know that rates of participation in sport are lower for women and girls than they are for men and boys. The gap in participation starts to widen at puberty. According to Women in Sport, nearly 60% of girls are not meeting exercise guidelines. A 2015 Sports Scotland report suggested that offering single set sports opportunities can help build confidence and can also be essential to ensure that women from religious and racial minorities can participate. Sport matters, whether at the elite or grassroots level. And I'd like to invite Sharon to Make some, make some comments. Thank you, thank you. It's really lovely to be back up here. Um, I Scotland to Glasgow recently. I've done so many sporting events. It's always such a treat to be up here. I even get on their bikes every time I'm up. Um, for me, this is a passion that comes from competing for, well, as you heard, you know, a decade against East Germans. Um, young East German girls were put through male puberty, uh, which was a horrendous thing, and they and they were given old fashioned steroids and testosterone. And it showed when the war came down that all the records could prove that they could make a 9% improvement on these young girls. And in the Olympics that I won my silver medal, being one of only two people outside of the Eastern Bloc that won medals, they took 90% of the women's medals and only 5% of the men's. And this was with a 9% benefit. Now, male to female performance at the Olympic Games is between 10 and 30%. 30% being things like weightlifting, anything that's very explosive, to sort of middle distance running at about 10%, and a lot of things in between, cycling, like swimming, 12, 14%. Long jump, high jump again, around the 20s. So it's absolutely massive. Um, and if we enable males to be in female sports, you are excluding females from that own category of sport. Now, sport is exclusionary by nature. You know, the whole reason we have the under 10s is so that the under 10s can race and that 12 year olds don't go in there and win. The reason why we have so many categories in the Paralympics is so that we can enable people with different disabilities to have fair competition. Uh, in boxing, you know, we have weight categories. All of these things are exclusionary because we're trying to create fairness in sport across society. 
if we enable people to identify into female sport, women's sport, women will be excluded from their own category of sport. And this is why I've spoken out, because I just don't want to see another generation suffer. This has nothing to do with being transphobic. This has nothing to do with wanting anyone to have the freedom to, to live safely, however they identify. I'm extremely pro that. Um, I'm not pro the sort of debate where debates are closed down because people are called names. Um, I'm pro respectful debate where we can talk about the science and talk about the, the impact. And so I felt that I couldn't sit back and not say anything. And it's been a very difficult you know, three, four years. And I'm very, very disappointed in the IOC. We decided not to take a scientific approach, not to look at the science. Um, four years ago, I got 60 of my friends that were all Olympic medalists, all world champions, to sign a letter to the IOC asking them to do the science before they change the rules. They took absolutely no notice of it whatsoever. And only three of those 60 people have ever put their heads above the pulpit. I did a, recently did a, a little um, poll on Twitter. I know it's only Twitter, but I have a very diverse following, male and female. And for 24 hours, I had 60,000 people respond. 97% said they wanted to see fair sport. Most people want to see fairness in society, and most people want to see fairness in sport. And I do not understand why our, our elected representatives are not listening to the people. Uh, and up here in Scotland, they need to listen to the people, because I'm sure they feel exactly the same way. There are ways that we can include everybody. You know, we can have a female protected classification, we can have an open and inclusive classification. So no one wants anyone to be banned from sport and nobody wants anyone to be excluded from sport. I love sport, I know what benefit it does for us physically and mentally. However, I am going to die on the hill that says I want fair sport for females because I just believe that we deserve it. Mara, your turn. Okay. <laughs> Well, forgive me that I'm going to repeat some of Sharon's points, but that's because they're extremely important points which really do need repeating over and over until people understand. Sport used to be inclusive for everybody until gender identity ideology arrived and infiltrated the world of sport. If categories didn't exist, the only people who would get a look in would be adult, able-bodied males, since they're the group which have the greatest physical abilities. In sports like boxing, uh, only the heaviest males would get a look in. We all recognise that sport should be for everyone, and therefore categories existed for those who have lesser physical abilities than adult able-bodied males. And by that I mean females, children, people with disabilities, and lighter individuals. These categories created fairness for everybody, not just a adult able-bodied males, and therefore made sport inclusive for everybody. As we all know, fairness is the central essence of sport, and without it, sports, sport stops being sport and instead becomes theatre. Until recently, these categories were unremarkable. Everyone accepted them and obeyed the rules. Then gender identity ideology came along, and the category of sport, by which I mean male or female, was done away with. Sports organisations everywhere created rules which allow males into female sports. Therefore, fairness and inclusion for females, which previously existed, ceased to exist. Some of these rules require males to undergo medical treatment, but in practice in the UK in many sports, access to female sport by males is purely by self-ID. This means women's sport, by which I mean sport for females only, effectively no longer exists. What continues to exist is men's sport, i.e. sport for males, and mixed sport, i.e. sports for both sexes. Whether or not males actually participate in what was women's sport is not relevant. They are allowed to currently, and therefore at any moment, one or more males could pop up and decide to participate. The end of a category exclusively for females only means the end of fairness for females because males have massive physical advantages compared to females, which are not fully removed by the testosterone suppression. Sharon has given you statistics on what those big differences amount to. Everyone knows this, even if some people pretend not to. You don't need to be a sports fan or a scientist to know this. A cursory glance at any equivalent male and female records will show that in 100% of cases, males outperform females. So sport used to be inclusive of everybody, but it no longer is. Now it is exclusive and discriminatory against females. We've all heard of Laurel Hubbard, a 43-year-old male whose inclusion in the Tokyo Olympics women's weightlifting 
prevented a young elite, world-class female weightlifter from becoming an Olympian, a life-changing experience. The Thundercrit cycle race in London, held two weeks ago, used to have two categories, one for men and one for women, which meant fairness and inclusion existed for both males and females. They have now got rid of these two categories and replaced them with two categories in which males enjoy fairness and inclusion, while females have no category which affords them fairness and inclusion. Predictably, males dominated the podiums in both categories at this race two weeks ago. This appalling impact on female athletes and women's sport is entirely predictable because something which is irrelevant in sport, gender identity, has been smuggled into the rule books by people who pretend that it's the same thing as biological sex. We all know it isn't the same. What is relevant in sport is sex, age, type of disability, and in some sports, body weight. The impact on sport of using gender identity as basis for categories is the same as if we forced onto the rule books any other irrelevant category, such as how long your hair is, what religion you follow, or which party you vote for. We can all see with our own eyes what gender identity ideology has done to women's sport, and I hope that political leaders will put a stop to it now, because a lot of damage has already been done. The Gender Recognition Reform Act, currently going through the, the bill, sorry, currently going through the Scottish Parliament, will, will make it much easier for anyone to obtain a GRC. We can reasonably assume from this that the number of males obtaining a GRC will probably increase. The bill removes all gatekeeping from the process and simply relies on self-declaration, as Susan explained. Therefore, the males who obtain a GRC will no longer be only those with a di di diagnosis of gender dysphoria, but any male who wants one. In sport, it is already, in practice, very difficult for sports clubs and officials to turn away any male who demands to participate in women's sport. A large increase in the number of males in possession of a GRC will simply make this situation worse. We can already see the devastating impact on women's sport all across the UK of males competing in, in female sport. Females are routinely excluded from things of value such as podium places, prizes, points, places on teams, etc. by males in their own female category. But a much bigger problem is self-exclusion by females who see males with unfair advantages competing in their own events. Last week, a, a photograph circulated on social media of a young girl looking humiliated and de dejected by the experience of having competed against a male in a women's competition. It's frankly a miracle that girls in this situation persevere with their sports, and I commend their courage. My question for, for Scottish parliamentarians is this. There will be talented, hard-working Scottish girls out there right now who, will, who could become the sports stars of future and win medals for Scotland. Are you happy for them to quit sport altogether because they have no chance of winning against male-bodied people? I have two requests for the Equalities Committee, which is currently scrutinising this bill. One, insert a clause into your bill which states unequivocally that women's sport is for those born female only, regardless of what any GRC or birth certificates say. This will provide for everyone not just males, that magic word which we all hold so dear, inclusion. And two, put your money, time and effort into serious work to get males in sport to be inclusive and welcoming to their gender non-conforming male peers. We saw in the spring this year Emily Bridges, female, fellow male athletes, being wonderfully welcoming and inclusive to Bridges at the Buck Cycling Championship in a photograph circulating on social media. If males everywhere, at all levels in all sports, would welcome and include their gender non-conforming male peers without question, then females could also enjoy fairness and inclusion without being told to budge up and give up your medals and trophies and places on teams because males are supposedly more important. Aside from female athletes, there is another group in sport which suffers exclusion because of gender identity ideology. Average males who have the decency to compete in their own male category. They compete fairly against their fellow males, but because they do not claim any special identity, 
they go home empty-handed. Why should they suffer when their fellow average males who claim a special identity can smash it in the female category and go home weighed down with prizes? I want to finish by talking about the development pathway. This is the process by which an individual transforms themselves from a beginner into an adult elite athlete, passing through various stages along the way, uh, for example, county, regional, national, continental, and world level. This process takes years, sometimes decades. It involves an, an enormous amount of hard work, training, and sacrifice, not only from the athlete themselves, but from family members and supporters as well. At any point along that pathway, an athlete can and will suffer setbacks and may leave the pathway altogether. In my case, the pathway from a sporty 11-year-old with a dream to the Olympics took 24 years. Throughout that time, there were numerous setbacks and near misses, such as failing to qualify for teams, injuries, not being selected for teams, and work pressures. All of these setbacks could have pushed me off that pathway at any time. It's akin to leaping through flaming hoops continuously for years. Males competing in the female category effectively destroys the development pathway for females. Every time a male competes in women's sport, he takes from numerous female athletes things of value which otherwise would help them to progress along that pathway, such as medals, points, qualifications, places on teams, prize money, and confidence. Right now, female athletes in the UK are being impeded, obstructed, and pushed off this development pathway by males competing in their own category. Some people in sport, including IOC President Thomas Bach, say women's sport at elite level must be fair, but lower down and at grassroots level it must be inclusive. What this means, effectively, is two things. First, they seem to believe that elite athletes just appear from nowhere as fully formed champions, which of course is completely untrue. And second, they are happy to destroy that development pathway, which enables females to progress, improve, and reach elite level. People say trans inclusion and women's sport is delicate and complicated. It's neither of these things. The solution is very simple. Males compete in male sports. Females compete in female sport. By doing that, fairness and inclusion would then exist for everyone, including females. Thank you. Thank, thank you both very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. <gasps> look who it is! <laughs> <laughs> no, Hi, you look different, you look older. <laughs> <laughs> Same as me, that's okay, because we've got children when we knew each other. Oh, okay. <laughs> so just in case anyone didn't know, Brian obviously used to run with my ex-husband, Derek. <laughs> Oh, it's lovely to see you. Nice to see you, Shane. Um, <laughs> we, uh, well, one of the things that is, is, uh, the issues that we're struggling with at the moment, as you know, is that the discussion seems to revolve around the elite sport. Um, and we can make that argument. Absolutely. That no problem at all. The fact that, you know, that, 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 that you know, if I decided to you know, try and back, would I still be a world record holder now by a considerable margin? Um, the problem is, of course, as you alluded to, is that there is grassroots sport as well, and we discussed this uh, yeah. at length, Sean, and that, that um, there, are, there, are, there are those who quite legitimately, quite legitimately want to participate and find the only place for participating in is within uh, women's grassroots sport, and, and not, not only uh, keeping other women out of the team, but especially in contact sport. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, contact yeah. sport. And I've seen it with my 13-year-old daughter competing against a full-grown uh, male. Um, and that there's an inherent danger that if we don't tackle this head on and we don't deal with this, we are actually not just preventing women to participate in sport, we're actually potentially putting them into a dangerous situation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, 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 you know, a male hits 160% harder than a female of an equivalent weight. Yeah. So if you put that in a rugby tackle, you know, it's, it's absolutely lethal. Not to mention, actually, that bone structures of, of biological females are also thinner and more fragile than bone structures of males. So you're putting the two worst things together. So it is a very, very serious accident waiting to happen. 
And it breaks my heart that we're almost having to wait for someone to break their neck before we go, this is dangerous, because we know this is dangerous. Now, World Rugby were one of the only responsible organisations in the world to say, right, we will not enable you know, transgender women to compete. Uh, what I find very frustrating is that the transgender community seems to think that by not being involved in the women's category, they're being banned, and no one is ever banning anybody. You know, we, we both love our sport, we want everyone to be involved in sport, we know how important it is to our physical and to our mental health, which is so very, very important in a world where mental health issues are going, you know, skyrocketing. So it's about trying to be inclusive that everybody gets to do sport, but by excluding young girls from their sports, from, by putting them in dangerous situations, by you know, not giving them role models that they can look up to, that this, this it's just it's absolute madness. So it is the hill that I'm prepared to die on because I just can't believe that we have to have the we have to have years of males winning before we realise that they're stronger when actually we don't need to do that, we just need to look at the record books. There's not a single piece of peer reviewed science in the whole of the world at the moment that shows that you can mitigate against male performance advantage puberty. So you know, if somebody has gone through male puberty, they just have this innate, and you know, and I know, you know, that's why we have a four-year ban, supposedly, if someone's taking testosterone, and that's what's so ludicrous <coughs> about this. We give someone a four-year ban if they take drugs to try to cheat to get the tiniest advantage in sport, but yet women are supposed to step back and say, yes, you can have an advantage, and I don't understand that. That, to me, just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You know, it's just incredibly frustrating. And on team sports, you know, you are excluding people from just wanting to do recreational sport in a team um, as well, at grassroots levels, at social levels. Um, so I just, we can be inclusive by having an open category. We can be inclusive by encouraging men to be more welcoming, as Mara said, you know, of people that identify as a different gender to the, to the sex that they actually are. Um, we know this happens in women's sport because both at the NC2As and at the Olympics last year, transgender men and female non-binary identifying females all chose to compete in the women's category. They do not choose to compete in the men's category. And yet transgender women, biological males, choose to go into the women's category. And you have to ask yourself, why is that as well? So, you know, we can, if women can be inclusive of transgender men, then I'm sure men can be inclusive of transgender women. And that's where we need to work. You know, that's where the inclusion needs to be. Not asking women to move over to their rights. You know, and I think also we forget that sport nowadays is a career. You know, in our day, it wasn't quite so much of a career, but it's given us a foot up for sure, and it's certainly given me you know, my opportunities. This is sex discrimination in the workplace as well, because sport is the ability for someone to have a career. You know, whether that's with your endorsements, whether that's with your opportunities on television, whether that's with your prize money, um, you know, so we're, we're turning around and we're saying well, now that males have a bigger opportunity to have a career in sport than women do. We are actually going to, and we've worked so hard over the last few, well, only probably the last decade, to bring women's sport through. I was only listening to Red this morning about women's um, football and how excited we're getting about the Euros and how, you know, England stands such a, sorry, England, dirty work, <laughs> but stands a very good chance. And, you know, that, that was, in my day, no one talked about that. You know, we've worked so hard to get this, to get that far, to get women's sport better opportunities, and now we seem to be taking steps backwards, and it's just, yeah. We need to do more. You know, I looked at the Times this morning. I was looking at stories on the sports pages, and do you know there was nine stories before we got to a women's story? nine stories before they even mention the word female sport and that happens every day almost it's hard going can i just respond to that as well so this distinction between elite and grassroots what people who say yes fairness at elite level but not at the grassroots level are saying effectively is good females deserve fairness less good females no no you can just do collateral damage i totally reject that and because of the development pathway point that I made, but also even for women who, let's be honest, will never be a lead or even semi-elite, they deserve fairness. They care deeply about their performances. They try just as hard as any elite athlete. I know I coach them. They, you know, competition is everything for them, even if they're not very active and not very not near the front of any any event. The second thing I would say is I absolutely agree with Sharon that. Sport must be inclusive for trans people. Sport is fantastic for everybody. It's great for our mental and physical health. Nobody is saying trans people should be banned from sport. And indeed, the UK Sports Council's Equality Group report last September, the SCEG report, called on NGBs to be creative about how we can include trans people and be welcoming and inclusive to them without 
damaging the female category. So that's what NGBs really need to be doing. We need to think creatively, make sport welcoming for everybody, but that cannot come at the expense of, of sport for females. This is how crazy it is. If I was to take up swimming again tomorrow morning and go and race, and if I race with five nanomoles of testosterone in my blood system tomorrow, which is the amount that Emily Bridges is allowed to cycle with next week, I would receive a full year ban. That's not true for people at the moment. So testosterone is banned for everybody in and out of competition on the, on the WADA prohibited list. This is what, what Sharon's talking about. So, you know, for females who want to com be, com be competitive, level the playing field, any amount of testosterone is banned and yet male endogenous testosterone up to male levels in the female category is considered acceptable. It's complete madness. Can I ask please, there's a, a committee around the corner and obviously considering gender reform at the moment. Um, that's happening here and yet you two ladies have had to come quite a long way to make this case. You're sort of disappointed that elite Scottish athletes are not coming forward and speaking It's out. not just Scottish athletes though, it really is. You know, everybody is scared because the moment you try to speak out and just ask for fairness, you get called names, you get death threats, you get the PRAs ringing up your employers, trying to get you sacked, trying to get you unemployed. You know, there's not been respectful debate on both sides of this. You know, I, it, it has to be out in the open. You know, it's shine the light on everything to find solutions for everybody. And that's what this has always been about from my side. It's never been about excluding trans people. It's been about promoting fair sport. Um, and I've spoken to many Scottish athletes, many retired swimmers. Um, I get athletes calling me every single week. I get coaches calling me every single week. I get a lot of coaches in tears because they don't know what the hell to do. They don't know how to deal with this. Um, I think it's terribly important that governing bodies talk to their athletes. You know, cycling has been the worst at not asking its athletes, its female athletes in particular, what they think. They have totally and utterly ignored them. And when they went to an advisory panel um, to decide to, to check on their transgender uh, rules, that, that consisted of a transgender female athlete who actually, when they were competing as a male athlete, received a, a drug ban for cheating and stonewall. And they not once asked a single female athlete. So, you know, it, it's so disrespectful that we don't even get a voice in our own competitions. <laughs> it's untrue, really. So, yeah, I mean, I would love to see more people coming out and speaking. And I think we're very, very strong if we speak together. Um, and in fact, you know, with, with, with regards to Emily Bridges, the reason that Emily didn't get to race in that particular race that we all know about was because the girls did come together behind the scenes and said, we will not race. And their coaches came together and said, we will not let the girls race. So they, they, they underestimate how, how powerful and strong they are. Um, but it's, it's difficult when you've got governing bodies telling them to be quiet. And you've got sponsors telling them to be quiet. And they're only just making enough money to pay their bills. Because it's not like swimmers, you know, and athletes and like just make an absolute fortune. They really don't. They're not footballers. They make just enough money usually to pay their bills. So, so you know, it, it's, it is very, very tough. But the good news is that FINA this weekend, which is the, the world governing body, um, I'm hope, very hopeful that they might bring some strong rules out. What we do need is for someone to break cover. We need a government. We need a party. We need a governing body. You know, we, we, we've got all the evidence. We've had this wonderful report of UK Sport, which was in October last year, and it categorically, in black and white, said you cannot have inclusion and fairness in the women's category. So how is it just okay to go with them when we can't have fair sport? Can I respond to that as well? So <clears throat> I've, I've followed this debate for some years, but it was only about a year ago that I started speaking out after reading a tweet from Sharon which said, if you're silent, you're complicit in this, and she's absolutely right. I have a lot of sympathy with female athletes, especially the currently competing ones, because they have a lot to lose. Their job is to train and compete, not to make sports officials do their jobs properly. Um, but since I've spoken out, I have had two fairly major uh, abuse episodes, but to be honest, the numbers of people supporting me have been overwhelmingly greater. I have complete strangers contacting me every week to say, thank you so much for defending women's sport, thank you for speaking up, thank you for being brave, I agree with you 100%, it's not transphobic, this is about the rights of women and girls. So my message out that for, for female athletes out there, and supporters of female athletes, fathers of daughters, you know, people with sisters and nieces and female cousins or pupils in their classes, they can't cancel all of us. You have to speak up. 
um, please, you know, I, we all know that there can be a personal cost attached to it, but the, the public, public opinion is very clear. Sharon did a poll of over 60,000 Twitter followers. Over 97% said no to males in female sport. Uh, there's a, a news story out today, uh, more in common, I think it's called. The think tank has done a survey. On sport in particular, people are, a big majority are opposed to males in female sport. So public opinion is very much on your side. So if you're, if you're a female athlete or a concerned parent or something out there, and you think, mm, what should I do? Please speak up. Contact Four Women Scotland. Contact Fair Play for Women. Contact me or Sharon. Speak up. Tell your friends. Because this is about the future of sport for half the population. Um, Sport Scotland have said that they, they don't think that the, the GRA reforms that are going through Parliament right now would have an impact on trans access to sport. And you've made that link mm -hmm. to the bill today. I mean, they're saying that the gender recognition certificate won't come into play when it comes to considering who gets to compete in which category. Um, so I just wondered if you could address that point and why you think it, the issue that we're talking about today is pertinent to that legislation. Yeah, I think... Um, I mean, I'm sure the others will have extra to add, but one of the biggest things that we have identified and MBM have identified is the Section 22 in the GRA, which gives this heightened level of privacy to people. So it becomes almost impossible to prove whether or not someone has a GRA. And it actually becomes a criminal offence in many um, situations to disclose that they have a GRC. So... Um, this is especially pertinent at grassroots. Again, at elite level, there are going to be ways where people will be able to maybe do a sex test or find these things out. But for an ordinary club, which is run by volunteers, somebody who is obviously male turning up um, and with female documentation, it, it's very, very difficult for those people at grassroots level to say, no, sorry, you can't do it, especially as they are not getting the support from necessarily from the governing bodies and especially as the lead taken in Parliament is that um, these people are, are who they say they are. Um, so it, it really needs a bit of a, a, a stronger statement, not just relying on the exceptions in the Equality Act, which actually, they're permissive, so people can ignore them if they want to, and there really does need to be a stronger carve out for sport, um, I'm sure. <laughs> That's good. Let's <laughs> have more questions. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's statement there in the Sports Scotland is actually incorrect. There's a couple of people in Sports Scotland that said that, but the organisations themselves have not declared that the, the, the general government will be uh, not in past sport. We're, we're, we're very, very selective about who we're picking here and who we're quoting. Sports Scotland. Can I clarify? They said that in evidence to the committee. So yeah, two like people from Scotland. No, no, two representatives from Sports Scotland. They aren't Sports Scotland. They're two representatives of Sport. they are not Sports Scotland. Until such time as the Chief Executive comes out and says that, and I'm afraid that, that I, don't, I don't believe that at all. So what, what can we do, Bram? What, what, what do you think? What is the simple thing that we can put in place that maybe needs to be added onto the legislation that would enable us to be able to enable that little volunteer at that meet, you know, at that competition? to protect um, you know, the entry list, really. Quite frankly, what we need to do is we need to have a Scottish committee that are prepared to listen to, to oh. people like yourself, mm -hmm. rather than select mm -hmm. those people uh, for that committee that will give them the answers that yeah. they want. I thought the committee were absolutely disgraced, and I saw that I wasn't even invited to that committee myself. Of all the people in Parliament who could speak up on this particular subject, I wasn't invited. You weren't invited, yeah. even though your name was put forward. It was two people who actually, quite frankly, had a little understanding. I, I do think the SNP have to be very, very careful here because they're not asking the right people. They're asking the people they want to hear the answers from. Mm -hmm. You know, and the whole point is um, to listen to the people. But also, if you're going to have any form of, of you know, select group of people, you need to have it cross party, you need to have it cross opinion, and you need to back it all up with 100% fact. And as much as I believe people are entitled to to identify however they like, a feeling can never trump a fact. You know, how on earth do we how on earth do we apply laws to a feeling? I don't understand how people can say my feeling is more important than your fact. 
when we don't even know how their feeling might change the next day or the next week? Or where does my feeling in all of this come into this? No one ever asks the feelings of the girls that get left behind. You know, it's only about the feeling of the person who gets to usurp her and go in. So, you know, I just think feelings are not what we should be basing laws and rules on. There was um, an incident, sorry, I was just going to say there was an incident a couple of weeks back at the Tweed Love Cycling where it's, it's a classic example. Their, their rules very specifically state that there were male and female categories and they were by birth sex. But um, a trans-identified individual entered the women's race, biologically male, won it, and the organisers didn't know until that person stepped onto the podium that they, they were in the incorrect category. And then, of course, that puts the organisers in a terribly and busy position because they have to then go back and... If they're, if they're going to be firm on this and say, no, you have to return that prize. And it's, it's, not, it's not something they should have to deal with, frankly. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, on that, you know, we've seen in recent years medals being reallocated and reawarded after doping disqualifications. You know, better late than never, but these athletes have all missed out on a life-changing event in, in, in as much as getting the medal at the event where you competed. And for females to be rung up by an event organiser, you know, six weeks later, and said, oh, actually, we've discovered that the person who won shouldn't have been there. You know, here you are, I'll send you your medal in the post. This is totally unacceptable. We've seen it because of doping. This cannot happen. Females who win something fair and square, whether it's a medal or a, a place or whatever it is, they must receive that on the day. Coming back to Brian's point about the, the bill, Self-ID is causing massive problems in women's sport now. And the mess if the bill passes, the message that will come from, from the Scottish Parliament is that this government endorses self-ID, in, including in sport. And I think that just sends totally the wrong message. Because, you know, without getting into details about whether you present a GRC or not at a sports event, I think it sends totally the wrong message. Far away. <laughs> right. um, yeah, Maya mentioned um, sort of self exclusion and, and the dangers of that. Um, I was wondering if you could just say a bit about how you think you would have felt before you were oh. an Olympian, um, you know, when you were sort of. Yeah, well, you know, see, that, that's the really interesting thing because obviously this is exactly how I felt because obviously I was competing against East Germans every single day. You know, all of my medals are bronzes and silvers behind East Germans, every single one of them. And every time I stood on that podium, I knew that they were cheating and they shouldn't have been there. And yet nothing was done. You know, we had the most amazing female athlete in a lady called um, Kathy Smallwood, yeah. who was just the inc most incredible. I mean, her, her British record for the 400 was only beaten by Christina Horogu not that long ago. She would have been such a household name. She's a teacher in the Midlands. You know, I had friends that came fourth behind three East Germans. No one had ever heard of them. And they would have been Olympic champions. And I know Mara then talked about, you know, re-giving people medals. Actually, we wouldn't be able to reallocate anybody's medals because these people that are racing right now under these rules are not breaking any rules. So no one can turn around and go, well, you shouldn't have that medal, we're going to give it to that person, because actually they're not breaking a rule by being in there. So it, it's so frustrating that, you, you know, that, that nothing was done. And nothing, the IOC did nothing for 20 years. And when the war came down and all the evidence was there, they still did nothing. And they're still doing nothing now. And they, you know, and, and these poor girls that were given these drugs, they let down two groups of society. You know, these girls that were fed these terrible drugs, and many of them had died. And then people like myself, you know, who missed out on the medals that they should have got, you know. And, and so the IOC are not the temple to hold up as the way to do things. We've only got to look at Sochi and what little they did about Sochi and the Russians taking drugs. They you know after the Olympic, the Winter Olympics, they did nothing. They constantly passed the buck. So what's happened in sport? The IOC has passed the buck, and the, the you know the international committees have sat there like this, going, Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I'm just very much hoping that Fina, I should be so proud of Fina the first to step up this weekend, you know, and actually do something, but we're going to have to wait and see until Sunday to see what they do. And then I'm just hoping that everyone will fall in and line behind, you know, and just go, right, this is what we should be doing, this is the gold standard. But we should not be waiting 10 years until a load of girls have lost before we go, this is a mistake. And that's what I was trying to stop by speaking up. I, I can answer that question as well. So I self-excluded because of doping. So when I was competing, there was a big group of athletes who I suspected were doping, and many of them were caught. And I chose events thinking, 
are members of this group likely to show up at this event? Because I'm sick of having to face unfair competition. And it was also a big factor in my decision to retire. I just thought, I'm, I'm sick of this. You know, I'm getting on, I'm going to retire. I'm, I'm done with unfair competition. So the same will apply to females facing males in their own category. And right now, I know of a group of females who are self-excluded from events uh, because of males competing. And some of them are considering quitting altogether. I'm not mentioning any names and I'm not mentioning the sport. Uh, but I know of self-exclusion self going on right now. It's very disheartening. Can you I just feel like you don't it? matter. Yeah, I, we, we hear from women and girls across a whole range of sports right across the UK. I've talked to um, students in Scotland who are potentially on track to be professional footballers. I've talked to cyclists. I've talked to uh, a bunch of different, different um, sports women. Uh, sometimes we talk to their parents, occasionally their coaches. And lots of these girls are saying to us, do you know, if, if I have to face that person, I'm just not going to play that weekend. So if it's a team sport, they'll say, I think I'll have to just pretend that I'm not fit or pretend that I'm not available because they daren't say that they don't want to play in an unfair competition. So the pressure, back to your point from earlier, the pressure on these young women to be nice, to be inclusive, to be accommodating of males in their teams and in their opposition is a disgrace. Mm -hmm. We're the adults. And luckily, we're in a position where we can say, do you know what, that's not fair, I can be kind. But there are limits here, and I'm going to be kind to these girls. So you might think that this is not a big problem, and it's easy to focus on the visible examples and when you see someone on the podium, but we know that particularly for teenage girls, this is happening everywhere, every day. And we really have to show some leadership here. And you know, it's good to see one politician here. I, I'd like to see a bit more leadership. Can I add to that? You can self-exclude if you know that there's going to be a male in the event that you're planning. If you don't know, yeah. yes. you turn yeah. up and you think, ooh, that person looks a bit manly, you know. You know, I know of an event recently with, in which a male competed. I'm not mentioning the sport. Uh, this person passes very well. I imagine all the females in that event were completely unaware that they were being subjected to unfair competition. They couldn't self-exclude. They weren't aware. Can I ask a question? Um, at the time that you were competing in Sharon, uh, it was a, a Japanese show who was a huge success, fascinating with race, of course. Now, I remember the newspaper uh, articles that were written about her because she looked, as you mm. put it, perhaps more manly than other uh, female competitors. She had a lot of stress. Yeah, I mean, that's how do you, how do, but how, how do you differentiate, or how do you expect grassroots people to differentiate between? Some sporty women and that, who are exactly, you know, and that's why the that's why the rules need to be very clear. Than, than, yeah, than they, you know, we need to have the, the the rules need to be very clear. They need to be very straightforward. They, there needs to be no ambiguity. You know, no sort of soft edges. Um, we just need to go female protected class, female at birth, female sex. I get really upset, you know, because a lot of the TRAs will talk to me about how it, how intrusive it is to start looking at gender. No one in the, I had a sex test in 1976 when I went to the Olympics, right? It was a three second swab on the inside of my cheek. That was it. It was less stressful than a COVID test, believe me. And it was never done again because you cannot change your sex. So once that sex test was done and put into a little jar and I was given the F, that was it. You know, it's utter rubbish to say that these things are intrusive. It's just another way yeah. to say how degrading this would be. It's not degrading to have a swab on the inside of your cheek, you know, that you only have once in your life. And Fatima the well and truly had one of those because she was competing during that era. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are going to be you know, a javelin thrower, you are probably not going to look like a ballet dancer. You know, I mean that. You know, we're all different shapes and sizes in sport, and that it's so wrong to judge people by their external appearance. And that's why, again, we want to go back to sport being about the biological sex, not about what you being look like. We live in a world where we are enforcing stereotypes, and it breaks my heart as a mother of a you know a 24 year old daughter. Lucky Grace has done sport, and she's really very sensible and very balanced. But a lot of young girls are thinking that if they don't look like Kim Kardashian, they must be a boy. Yeah. I never look like that. I was climbing trees, knocked my teeth out, you know, I was playing football with the boys, training with the boys all the time, up a tree, you know, I mean, sex is not 
how feminine or masculine you are. Sex is a biological reality, and we seem to be losing sight of that. And, and you know, that, that's really where sport needs to be, the biological reality. I think the vagueness of the situation invites bad feeling and suspicion. And, you know, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a, a manly looking female. Or a feminine looking guy. Yeah. You know, but, you know, if there's a manly looking female at an event and we're in this current situation where it's a sort of free for all, that is going to invite people to say, oh, you know, is that, is that a male in my race? And maybe submit a complaint to the organizer. This is not helpful for anybody. Therefore, Sharon's absolutely right. Absolutely clear rules are needed and need to be enforced so that everybody can participate in sport at any level, confident that the males are in the male category, the females are in the female category, end of. And then, you know, you don't need to get into debates about what people look like or, you know, what their muscles look like, anything like that. There was an unverified report on Twitter last night that the Department of Culture, Media and Sport mm. may be considering legislating on this. Does it need politicians to touch yes, it? Yes, it does. Because the sporting bodies seem opted to do so. Does it need political action? Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I mean, I went into Westminster, very much like I've come up today, you know, but I went into Westminster about a month ago and had a chat with quite a few different people. And again, you know, when you talk to people, they're all, oh yes, we understand, and oh yes, something should be done, but nobody's doing anything. There's all the talking in the background, and all the agreeing, but no, everyone is sitting on their hands, and we actually just need some politicians to be brave and to take some action, and to go that, you know, 51% of this country is female. We deserve to be looked after, the same as those that are male in sport. Um, and, you know, it has a, has a knock on in, in everything. And, Yes, please, you know, politicians, do something. You know, give the guidance. We had a wonderful report which came from UK Sport, and it was such a shame that they didn't grasp that by the, by the nettle back in October. And instead of throwing it back to the NGBs and saying, OK, you can't have fair sport and inclusion, now decide what you're going to do, they should have just said, we cannot have fair sport and inclusion, prioritise fairness. That's what they should have done. We're and probably we going to have to wrap up quite soon, so are there any quick... Quick question. Yeah, just a really quick one. Um, you've obviously spoken mostly about fairness in when, when you're competing, but do you have any concerns about um, sort of loss of single sex spaces and things like changing rooms? And might that be yeah. a factor that would put girls off? Absolutely, I'm sure it does. You know, particularly with, with sort of um, you know minority groups and religious groups and things. I mean, it certainly impacts on you know the Asian women who want to swim, um, Jewish women. You know, definitely minority groups who are very staunchly not prepared to share a changing room with someone of the opposite sex. So, you know, again, we are including but excluding. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to be really careful of. You know, who are we ex excluding by these, by these new rules? Um, but I tend to stick on sport because I know it really well. I know all the science, you know, and I've done an awful lot of research on it. So I'm going to leave all of that to the other ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, just, you've come all the way up to do this press conference. Do you want to appear before the committee? If they asked me, I, I spoke to Brian. Brian was on the phone to me, what, a, a month ago? Yeah. And said, would you? And I said, absolutely, I would happily do it. Yeah. You know, because again, I have, I have so many people that do speak to me and I feel like a bit of a conduit at the moment because they are frightened to, to, to speak out for themselves. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like I'm speaking for a lot of my, I've spoken to quite a few Scottish swimmers, um, as you can imagine, very successful swimmers. You know, and they are, they would not speak out. They are scared how it would impact them. I, I wrote to the committee after their sport evidence session um, and I've just received a reply saying they're not going to be holding any further sessions on sport. What do you say to that? They need to listen to female athletes and they need to listen to people who care about women's sport. Um, I think that's that's us to say thank you. I'm getting I'm getting signals from uh, Marion at the back. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming. And, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much for coming and listening. Thank you. Thank you. Photo, video, drone available for hire. Check out cdfimages.com.